Chapter 7 Gallic Testimony The religious spirit of the Gaul diminished with the coming of the Franks, but the fire never flickered in Britain. It flamed like a volcano, fiery in its evangelism and bursting forth fiercely at foreign interference. To strike at her Christian institutions and sacred edifices is to pierce her heart, causing her people to fight back with invincible fury that will ever astonish the world and will ultimately shatter her enemies. Long before the arrival of the Bethany castaways at Marseille, Guisois informs us that the south of France was known as the Province Viennois, populated by Gauls, Phoenicians, and Greeks, quote, with the Gauls most populous everywhere, end quote. The significance of this is quite important. The Phoenicians and the Greeks had a long association with the south of France, particularly the Phoenicians, who were the leading mariners before the Grecian seafaring ascendancy. The ancient port of Marseille was the chief port of call for both the comings and goings in the transportation of tin and lead from Britain. Over the centuries a common friendship had developed between them and the Gauls. Consequently, it is understandable how Phoenician and Grecian colonies came to be founded in Gaul. Marseille is reputed to be the oldest city in France and its oldest seaport. It was a port long before either settled there, but it was the Greeks who developed the port to its peak of prominence and gave it the name it bears. However, we should never lose sight of the fact that the port had its first association with the biblical ships of Tarshish, commanded by the Danites of the tribe of Dan. They were the first great sea power in history and the first to know intimately the inhabitants of Britain and to trade with them. The Phoenicians and Greeks were very largely Danites. At the time of our story, the port of Marseille was familiar with the ships of Joseph. To the Gallic populace, his name was well known, as are the names of Carnegie, Schwab, and Bethlehem Steel to us today. Therefore, it can be well assumed that Joseph had many influential friends at Marseille, who would gladly welcome him amongst them. Among the Gauls, there existed a deep receptivity for the persecuted followers of the Way. Between the Gauls and the Judean advocates of Christ, there was mutual sympathy. The Gauls were Druidic, and their faith held sway over all Gaul, which explains more than anything else why the land was a safe haven for Joseph and the Bethany family, as well as the many other converts who had previously found refuge there, after a safe escape from Judea in the ships of Joseph. Those who have been indoctrinated by the false stories describing the Druidic religion may pause in consternation. The malevolent infamy heaped upon the Druidic priesthood, their religion with the practice of human sacrifice, is just as untruthful, vicious, and vile as the other distortions stigmatizing the ancient Britons. On close examination, it will be found that those who uttered the vindictive maledictions stand out in Roman history as the dictators of the Roman triumvirate. Their bestial hatred for everything that was British and Christian deliberately promoted the insidious propaganda to defame the people they could neither coerce nor subdue. In our own time, among others, none other than the eminent archaeologist Sir Flinders Petrie, on examination of the ground around and under the altar at Stonehenge, completely exploded the infamous accusations. He found only the fossilized bones of sheep and goats, which more firmly established the affinity with the patriarchal faith of the East. In each case, the sacrificial burnt offerings were as stated in the biblical record. The influence Druidism had upon the rest of the ancient world and its peaceful and ready reception of the Christian faith proves its noble structure. Hume, the high-ranking British historian, acknowledged for his impartiality and the lack of bias in his reporting, wrote, quote, No religion has ever swayed the minds of men like the Druidic, end quote. It prepared the way for Christianity by its solid acceptance of the way. But for Druidism, Christianity might never have flourished. It drove the first nails into the Christian platform that held it fast through its early stresses, giving it the vigor to endure all posterity. The Roman persecutors, despising Druidic opposition, intensified their malignancy with the British conversion to Christianity. The emperors Augustus, Tiberius, and the Claudian and Diocletian decrees made acceptance of Druidic and Christian faith a capital offense, punishable by death. Some have claimed that this persecution by Rome drove both the religions together to form the solid phalanx of Christianity. This is far from being the case. It has already been pointed out how the ancient Chimri were bonded in the ancient patriarchal faith even before they arrived in Britain. 
organized by Hu Gadarn, Hugh the Mighty, the faith took on the name of Druid, a word some claim derived from the Celtic word Drius, meaning an oak, arising out of the custom of worshipping in the open with the famous oak groves of the island. A more likely derivation is from Druthen, quote, a servant of truth, end quote. The motto of the Druids was, quote, the truth against the world, end quote. A casual study of the triads emphasized the old Hebrew faith with positive clarification. The British Mother Druidic Church continued to teach the immortality of the soul, the omniscience of one God, and the coming of the Messiah. They were aware of the prophesied vicarious atonement and, extraordinary as it may seem, the actual name of Jesus was familiar to them long before the advent of Christ. They were the only people to know it and say it, a fact that has astounded students of theology. From this it can be clearly seen that there existed a mutual understanding between the Druid and converted Judean on religious principles that readily opened the door to general acceptance of the way. From this we can believe it was no accident whereby the refugee followers of the way found a natural haven in Gaul and their apostolistic leaders a safer sanctuary in Britain. At that period in history, Britain was the only free country in the world. Gaul had received its baptism of Roman persecution long before the Caesars turned their attention upon the British. It was the constant aid given the Gaulish brethren by the warriors of Britain which brought about the invasion of the Isles. The first attack, led by Julius Caesar, 55 BC, was purely a punitive expedition against the Britons for thwarting his arms in Gaul. Contrary to general opinion that Caesar's attack was a conquest, it was a dismal failure. Within two weeks his forces were routed and pulled back into Gaul. On his return to Rome, Caesar was openly ridiculed by Pompey's party in the Triumvirate. His famous legend, Veni Vidi Vici, I came, I saw, I conquered, was satirized by the pens of the Roman elite. They wrote in rebuke, I came, I saw, but failed to stay. Over the ten years that followed to 43 BC, the mightiest armed forces of Rome, led by its ablest generals, fought to establish a foothold in Britain. In this, Caesar failed to penetrate farther than a few miles inland. It was not until the reign of Hadrian, A.D. 120, that Britain was incorporated, by treaty, not conquest, within the Roman dominions, as described by Spartans in Vita Hadriani. By this treaty, Britons retained their kings, land, laws, and rights, accepting a Roman nucleus of the army for the defense of the realm. Surely no one can misconstrue this conquest or support the belief that naked barbarians could defy and defeat the Roman legions during those ten years led by its emperors and greatest generals. The invasions were repelled by the famed British Pendagon, Caswallon, who reigned for seven years after the invasion. For Gaul it was not to last. They lacked the security of the seas, which protected the British Isles. Unhappily, Gaul, later to be known as France, was destined to be the world crossroads of continental invasion, and on its soil, up to our time, some of the bloodiest battles in all history have been fought. Until the coming of the Franks, the Visigoths, Ostrogoths, and Vandals, the Gauls for centuries were to carry on the great evangelizing work of Christianity, laying the foundation of the church by the great leaders who stemmed from Britain, with carefully formed plans. It was to be immortalized with the presence and great work of Philip, Lazarus, Mary Magdalene, and the other Marys, each of whom left an enduring mark in the name of their Savior. Citation, C.F., J.W. Taylor, The Coming of the Saints. As the story of Arimathea is brought forth to the light of day, so are those others who labored under his instruction, lifted out of the obscure darkness of the past to thrill us with their devotion and sacrifice. The record shows that Joseph frequently journeyed to Gaul to confer with the disciples, particularly with Philip, who had arrived at Marseille ahead of Joseph, and was awaiting him and the Bethany family. It must not be forgotten that Joseph, by his tin-mining interests in Cornwall and Devon, had a long association with the British. Consequently, the comings and goings of his ships most certainly would have kept the British up to date with the world happenings and also with Gaul. Long before Joseph arrived in Britain, the scandal of the cross was known to them and had become a cause of grave concern to the Druidic Church. 
By similarity of patriarchal faith and knowledge of prophecy, the Druidic prelates recognized in the death of Christ the fulfillment of prophecy. The swiftness with which the Druidic delegates journeyed to Gaul to meet Joseph shows how concerned they were to obtain first-hand information. Contrary to the fallacious story of later historians, there was no argument, civil or religious, no bloodshed. It was an open acceptance that elected Joseph of Arimathea to the head of the Christ-converted British Church. From then on, the Druidic name and the old religion in Britain and Gaul began to be superseded by the Christian name, which the British created to identify the accepted Christ faith, formerly known as the Way. The miraculous safe arrival of Joseph and his companions at Marseille, and thence to Britain, surely was the will of God working out his inscrutable purpose gradually to fulfill the prophetic words of Jesus, to come to the lost sheep of Israel. From that time commenced the organization of the Christian clan, the marshalling of their forces into determined action. Thus began the epical drama that was to change imperial destiny and lead the peoples of the world to a better way of life unbelievable tragedy. Yet, before this was to be fully achieved, millions were to wade their way through unbelievable tragedy, defying tyranny in its basest and most terrifying form, wholesale massacre and fiendish torture, suffering the brutalities of the Colosseum, the horrors of the fetid prison of the Mamertine, and the dreadful scourging wars in which the British were to make the most colossal sacrifice in blood and life known to history.